Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany saw his long-held desire of ruling over a country that had become a sea power the equal of her great rival Britain finally crushed in 1918. The following year, the remains of his fleet sank into the grey, turbulent waters of Scarpa Flow as the German Navy scuttled all its ships in a final act of defiance. It was a bitter moment for the German nation and the exiled Kaiser. Yet just 20 years later, the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, had once again grown into a powerful weapon, nurtured this time through Hitler's Third Reich. By 1939, Germany was eager and ready to wipe out the stain in her naval history. Germany possessed a terrifying weapon to make sure Hitler's ambitions were realized. It was destined to be in the forefront of the struggle to subdue Germany's overseas adversaries, especially Great Britain. The U-boat. In 1939, after a decade of clandestine rebuilding, the Kriegsmarine was ready to face the ultimate test, war against the mighty British Navy. Although it was not envisaged that the U-boats would make a significant contribution to German victory, they in fact became Germany's main weapon in the war at sea. One which not only spread fear and loathing, but which could have turned Britain into an outpost of the Third Reich. Adolf Hitler now felt confident enough to show his true intentions to the world. The ships launched into the Baltic and Northern waters were revolutionary in design and commanded by officers of merit many of whom had served with the Imperial Navy in World War I. The humiliation of that conflict was still strong in their minds and outweighed the lingering doubts and distaste many harbored for Hitler's regime. As the Blitzkrieg rolled over Europe, Hitler felt certain that the limited role he had designed for the Navy was indeed going to prove sufficient. Up to a point, the stature he craved for the German nation required a modern, impressive fleet. But he did not expect the Kriegsmarine to meet the Royal Navy head-on. The imbalance was still too great. Hitler's impatience for military glory was one step ahead of naval re-equipment. And although in the late 1930s the construction of 200 U-boats was ordered, 57 were available at the outbreak of war. Hitler failed the U-boat crews as lethally as he was to fail every section of his armed forces. The revived Kriegsmarine Admiral Erich Rieder, a clever strategist. The fleet also possessed a commander of high ability in Admiral Karl Dönitz. Schooled in the old Imperial Navy, their sense of dedication to duty and fatherland 
enabled them to serve under a man they both wanted little to do with. Dönitz already knew what Hitler was like. The Admiral thought that war with England was inevitable, but had been assured by the Führer that any hostilities with England would start only in 1946 at the earliest. Nonetheless, as the war progressed, Dönitz was slowly drawn into becoming an admiring supporter of the Führer. At the outbreak of war, Grand Admiral Erich Reder's uncompromising message to his men was that they should know how to die with dignity, and none were more likely to have to bear the consequences of that order than the U-boat crews. When the radio message came through to the operational U-boat crews in 1939 that war against England had been declared, there was no jubilation amongst the men. They knew that Britain's navy was an adversary to be feared. The very first day of the war brought with it the warning of what to expect from the merciless attacks of the U-boats. In contravention of all codes of war, ostensibly by mistake, the passenger liner Athenia, with 1,400 passengers, was sunk. It was a bad start for the U-boats. Dönitz quickly needed to restore his status and that of his U-boats with Hitler. Shortly after, he did exactly that. In September 1939, the mercilessness of the coming battle for the Atlantic was only too clearly demonstrated when 500 men were lost as the British aircraft carrier Courageous was sunk, a terrible blow to the Royal Navy. Worse was to come. In Scarpa Flow, the battleship Royal Oak was torpedoed with the loss of 833 lives. Gunther Prien, commander of the U-boat, received a hero's welcome, especially from Dönitz himself, the designer of the operation, and its success allowed him to try and pressurize Hitler into increasing the number of boats being built. Only 28 new boats had been launched in 1939, just enough to replace those lost. Merchant shipping was soon to feel the full fury of the U-boat. There were three categories of U-boat, the Type 2, the Type 7, and the Type 9, with a double hull suitable for long trips over the oceans. As so often, Hitler's enthusiasm for his own favored theaters of war disadvantaged other vital areas, and Dönitz was never to achieve the target of 300 U-boats that he calculated would bring Britain to capitulate. Hitler would live long enough to reflect bitterly on his strategic fumbling. It was the Type 7 that came to be feared by the British mariners in the Atlantic. With its low conning tower and ability to dive within 30 seconds, it was ideal for the role it was assigned. Once submerged, it could dive safely to 200 meters in an emergency, an important factor when depth charges could be lethal at 160 meters. Traveling on the surface, the Type 7 had a range of 2,000 miles. Its top speed was 12 to 16 knots. Below the surface, 4 to 8 knots made them dangerously vulnerable after torpedo release, even though they could stay submerged for over 24 hours if necessary. The very weapon that made the U-boat such a terrifying opponent was also its weakness. For the telltale wave in the wake of the torpedo could turn the hunter into the hunted as depth charges spread out around the submerged boats and the lethal explosions that could burst the hull began. Lights went out. Men, glass, equipment, any loose objects were hurled against the juddering hull whose two centimeters of steel 
were all that separated the men from fathoms of water. Fear coursed through them, and nerves were at breaking point. The deeper the boat dived, the less pressure was needed to damage the hull. Yet in this claustrophobic terror, total silence had to be maintained, sometimes for days on end, to avoid sonar detection. The men hardly moved, ate, or drank. The smallest sounds could be heard from miles away. Breathing became heavy as the CO2 content of the air increased. In desperation, some boats released oil or offal as a decoy to persuade a destroyer that the submarine had been hit and call off the search. If forced to surface during this cat-and-mouse chase, destroyers might ram the boat or the deck guns of the British ships would finish the crippled submarine. Chances of survival were even slighter than they were for the men of the surface fleets on both sides. Nonetheless, the British Admiralty had learned its lessons from World War I and swiftly implemented the convoy system after the attack on the Athenia, an acknowledgement of the importance to Britain of the almost 4,000 merchant ships, the largest fleet in the world. In this phase of the war, Britain was put into a position of merely defending, not attacking, and the naval escort role was not to chase the U-boat, but to ensure the safe passage of the convoy, not a situation the Royal Navy was accustomed to finding itself in. Although unable to completely prevent torpedoes getting through, the convoy system was immediately effective, especially if able to rely on surface and air escorts. Steaming in columns 1,000 yards wide, with 600-yard gaps between ships, convoys, often consisting of between 45 to 60 ships, sailed in a block extending over many miles of ocean. Admiral Karl Dönitz took great pride in his U-boat fleet. Under his wing, the U-boats achieved stunning successes from the very beginning as they prowled the North Sea and the Atlantic under orders to bring Britain to her knees. Especially during the initial phase of the war, Dönitz permitted German U-boat crews to adhere to their code of humanity wherever possible thereby risking Hitler's displeasure. His steadfastness on this point saved lives, and British seamen would often be supplied with provisions, or even have their life rafts towed to safety before their ship was finally sunk. For the most part, the war at sea was impersonal. Crews on and below the water would hardly ever see the destruction and death they caused. They simply carried out orders to the best of their ability. As the war became increasingly bitter, the battles followed a pattern of ruthless destruction, kill or be killed, and acts of humanity were no longer possible. Once the US Navy had joined in the war, US ships were ordered not to stop to pick up survivors, friend or foe. One ship was allotted for rescue missions. If it passed by, there was no hope for any stranded sailors. The danger from U-boats still lingering in the area was too great to ignore. One American plane bombed a surfaced U-boat towing lifeboats, whose decks were overflowing with rescued men. Adrift in the waters around their stricken vessels, there were incidences where British sailors were machine-gunned as they struggled to board life rafts or floated in the oil-thick waters. In April 1940, Norway came under attack, and the German troop landings were protected by U-boats recalled from the Atlantic. But the U-boats Achilles' heel, torpedoes that failed to detonate, saved the British from a disaster. The British fleet, sailing to counter the surprise invasion, was left unscathed by every torpedo that was fired, 
the failure was devastating for the Royal Navy inflicted heavy losses on the Kriegsmarine, leaving just six vessels operational, and Dönitz was deeply humiliated. Fortunately, by then, the value of the U-boat had been proven beyond doubt, and Dönitz was still in a strong position with Hitler. The true leader of the war at sea was the man who commanded the U-boat. The most effective weapon for the surface ships of the Kriegsmarine turned out to be the magnetic mine, many of which were set out along the English coast in operations as brave as they were cunning. 67 ships fell victim to the mines. With the occupation of Norway, and especially France in 1940, and their use as forward bases, the range of the U-boats was increased considerably. As the losses to British shipping steadily rose, so too did the possibility that what the Luftwaffe had failed to do in the Battle of Britain, the U-boats would achieve by starving the country into submission. Yet despite Hitler's approval of the U-boats, he missed another golden opportunity to remove the danger posed by Britain and the U-boat arm was denied the support that was vital if it were to capitalize on its successes. For by the end of the year, Hitler's attention was increasingly focused on a campaign in Russia. Hitler's delusion of infallibility, his inability to assess situations accurately, was already shackling his officers. Money was still being funneled into a surface fleet at the expense of the submariners, a decision that was finally to help destroy the Third Reich. The other factor that prevented the U-boat arm from achieving the goal Dönitz had set for it was Göring. His insistence on keeping the Luftwaffe exclusively within his sphere of influence prevented cooperation between the two vital arms of the forces and the U-boats from gaining ultimate superiority at sea. Fokker Wolf Condor reconnaissance planes that began patrol flights over the Atlantic in the late summer of 1940 gave a dramatic demonstration of what could have been achieved. Their presence proved invaluable. For with the information they provided, the U-boats were no longer traveling blind. The effect on the battle was predictably good, with 30 Allied ships sunk in the two months following their introduction. In America, President Franklin Roosevelt was a voice in the wilderness. The American people and Congress were at first unwilling to help Britain's lone war effort. Finally, they agreed to supply 50 old destroyers, but only in return for American bases on British West Indian territories in order to protect their own backyard. Roosevelt was forced to go one step at a time in bringing the American public and Congress into line with his desire to aid Britain. And later he helped Churchill by the introduction of the Lend-Lease Act, which enabled American fuel and materials to flow towards Britain. For U-boat detection, the British were restricted to visual observation at the outbreak of war, a severe handicap. A lone periscope was practically invisible in the grey waters. The merchant ships were much larger targets, seldom missed by the torpedo once the captain had ordered battle stations and the stopwatch was timing the estimated distance to the target. The first piece of equipment that came to the aid of the defenders was the hydrophone, designed to detect the noise of propellers. It was far from perfect. Not only was it extremely unreliable, it was also necessary for the ship to shut down its own engines for it to be effective. U-boats could easily avoid unwelcome attention by shutting down their own engines and lying motionless on the seabed. More sophisticated was the ASDIC, a sonar device which emitted high-frequency pulses registering the reflected sounds from the submarine hull. At full speed, 
the British ship could detect the depth and direction of the enemy. Despite the early versions of the ASDIC losing the signal when directly above the U-boat, this equipment was a great improvement. If the U-boat crew heard the telltale sound reverberating from the hull, they knew that the gurgling descent of the depth charges would not be long in coming. Even so, the ASDIC was unable to prevent the happy time by which the initial phase of the war was known to the U-boat crews from continuing. The men of the U-boats enjoyed celebrity status. They were an elite band akin to the Luftwaffe pilots. And like the Luftwaffe, the submariners honored their heroes such as Otto Kretschmer, Wolfgang Luth, or Erich Topp, commanders whose crews had made the most kills. Life in the narrow, claustrophobic gangways of the U-boat was anything but luxurious. Conditions were inhospitable. The engines throbbed continuously. Fresh food was only available for the first two weeks of a patrol. After that, the continuous damp meant that tinned food had to be served, although it was at least plentiful. With lights burning constantly, day and night ceased to have any meaning. Sleeping and waking hours were jumbled by the need for constant alertness and action at any time. The bunks were shared by the men, one duty watch replacing the other in turn. The stench of sweat and oil seeped into their skin from lack of clean water, and they could be at sea for months at a time, uncertain at every moment of terrifying death from depth charges. A well-placed charge would burst the steel of their boat and transform it instantly from a deadly weapon into a water-filled grave from which there was no escape. The same fate awaited them even if the depth charges merely damaged the engines. The boat would gradually sink to the ocean floor, with the hapless crew aware that either suffocation or implosion of the hull and drowning was to be their final experience. Depth charges were sent out in a box pattern. Two were rolled off the back of the ship and after a short pause, two would be fired from the deck, followed by two more thrown and a further two rolled from the back. Sometimes U-boats could be under depth charge attacks for days. It was then that the feeling of hopelessness and mercilessness that their own attacks had engendered came back to haunt every minute of life that remained to them. One of the horrors of war was a sound no German submariner or British sailor ever forgot. Eerie, terrible sounds as a ship or submarine broke apart to sink howling and bursting into the depths of the sea. The crews thought of the men now struggling for their lives in the freezing waters. It was hard but necessary to suppress the thought that one day their own lives would end with equal cruelty. One Atlantic battle in that September of 1940 was to earn Lieutenant Captain Joachim Schepke a uniquely lethal record. On the 20th, there were ideal U-boat conditions in the Atlantic. A moderate wind and just occasional showers to give cover. Convoy HX-72, en route from America to Britain with 42 ships, had formed into nine columns, escorted by a patrol vessel, a destroyer, and one American cruiser. Not until the convoy reached a position some 400 miles west of Ireland would it meet up with British Western Command destroyers. And before then, for some 20 hours in mid-Atlantic, it would lose the escort support. As they raced through this mid-Atlantic gap, they were a sitting duck target for marauding U-boats. Late that day, U-boat commander Gunther Prien spotted the convoy. It was now completely unescorted either by sea or air. Dönitz was informed and ordered five more U-boats to take up positions 
whilst Prine placed his boat ahead of the oncoming ships and waited. Dönitz gave the order for attack. The boats closed in on the helpless convoy, the largest number of U-boats ever deployed in a convoy attack. Early in the morning on the 21st of September, the waves rippled as the first torpedo tube released its deadly load. For the next 24 hours, the convoy was hit repeatedly as torpedo after torpedo hissed through the sea onto the defenseless targets. Explosions tore the ships asunder, hurling men into the bitterly cold waters. One ship, blown apart by a single torpedo, sank in under 40 seconds, taking 34 men with it. The killing went on throughout the day and culminated in an orgy of death and destruction with the arrival of Commander Joachim Shepka in U-100 in the evening. His was the last of the boats to join the attacking formation and the most deadly efficient. Just three hours later, his boat had added another seven ships to the tally, a feat unequaled throughout the war. Shepka later met a gruesome death when the damaged U-100 was rammed on the surface by a destroyer in 1941. Shepka, refusing to leave the bridge, had his legs torn off as the destroyer smashed into the stricken U-boat. Hurled into the sea by the impact, he went down with his boat. Advances in radio communication were also to bring about a significant change. For the radio signals passing between the U-boats and Dönitz at operational headquarters could now be intercepted by the High Frequency Direction Finder, nicknamed the Huffduff. Now it was possible for the U-boat's location to be pinpointed. Even more important were the aerials that appeared in 1941 on the mastheads of the British destroyers. They belonged to the radar screens that had proved so vital during the Battle of Britain. For far too long, the German High Command refused to believe that radar was the reason U-boats were being detected. Slowly, the British began to wrest the initiative from the Germans. The happy time was well and truly over. In June 1941, Hitler ordered the invasion of Russia. The U-boats were ordered into new waters in the Arctic north of Russia to sever Allied shipping supplying the Soviet war effort. The submarines arrived by the end of the month. In these, the most perilous, unforgiving seas in the world began hazardous operations for the U-boats. In the deadly cold, Mariners were as liable to die in one of the terrible storms that churned the icy waters as from enemy fire. 78 ships were sunk by German U-boats for the loss of 38 German crews in the second half of 1941. By mid-1941, American ships were unofficially escorting British shipments, although the USA was technically a neutral country. Fired on by the U-boats, the US Navy began to lose warships, their crews suffering the same fate as the British, drowning in freezing waters and burning oil. Yet still, Roosevelt did not declare war on Hitler Germany. December brought an unexpected dramatic development. Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Having already lost touch with reality, Hitler foolishly declared war on the United States. Perhaps the confidence displayed by Dönitz, who dismissed the US Navy as unprofessional and an easy prey for his torpedoes, lulled the Führer into this absurd provocation. For it was only then, when Germany declared war on the USA on December the 11th, that the American Congress voted to declare war on Germany. And our American merchant ships must be protected. Churchill 
finally had his wish. With absurd overconfidence, Hitler had unleashed powers that would rise up to engulf him. Yet at first, it seemed that he would come through. Ten days after the declaration of war on the USA, an attack in US waters was prepared. Despite U-boat commanders not being issued with maps, so that spies could not discover what was going on, and just five of the larger Type 9 U-boats making the long trip to America's eastern seaboard, Operation Drumbeat began with a repeat of the first happy time. The boats caused havoc to American ships. On January the 13th, 1942, the U-boats went into action. Operating singly with targets sought out in the previous days, all submarines struck on the same day. 25 ships were sunk in this, the first strike of Operation Drumbeat. The British Admiralty already knew the route of the boats and passed these on immediately to the American Navy. Yet the Americans did not react. Their destroyers were left in docks with all the lights along the coast still burning brightly. It was as though they didn't take Hitler seriously. U-boat commanders were amazed and delighted. The extraordinary lassitude by the man in charge of the American Navy, Admiral King, was the result of his dislike of the British. Worse still, his ego could not allow him to follow the British example and introduce the convoy system. Tankers would still sail alone and simply be blown out of the water. Admiral King's emotional handicap was an unforgivable failing that wasted American lives unnecessarily. From Maine to the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, U-boats brought the war home to the astonished Americans. Barely one month after operations began, with almost free reign in the American coastal regions, the submarines had sunk 156,939 tons. This pattern of unhindered destruction and dying went on for month after month. The U-boats delivered the greatest U.S. naval defeat in World War II. Some 500 ships with 5,000 men were to be lost in the six months before Admiral King was forced to abandon his obstinate stance, allowing the USA finally to gain a measure of control over the situation. Subsequent waves of U-boats sent into American coastal waters produced equal success. It was vital to prevent the oil supplies from getting to Britain. The boats wreaked havoc in the Gulf for two years, but ultimately failed in their main objective. The Americans were unable to hit one single U-boat in the first three months of Operation Drumbeat. This meant easy work for the U-boats. The USA had been caught out and was paying the price. Hitler was delighted, and awards for the crews were soon being handed out back at the U-boat pens in northern France. For the tankers, American waters had become lethal. Britain's fate was hanging by a thread. Off the eastern coast of North America lay a stretch of water known as Torpedo Alley. For six months, it was a scene of horror. British naval intelligence was received each day. Admiral King chose to ignore it. Only when the losses continued to mount unchecked was he forced to adopt the convoy system that had proven indispensable to Britain. The effect was immediate. For the U-boats, the happy time in America was now over. They returned to their old hunting grounds in the Atlantic, and America now became a lower priority. A breakthrough in U-boat detection was introduced by the British in mid-1942. Airborne radar technology meant that a surfaced U-boat could be detected from a distance of many miles. 
bombers might descend unexpectedly from the clouds, diving straight at the U-boats. For a short time, the U-boat losses mounted, until the Germans, finally catching on to the importance of radar, issued their boats with the so-called Biscay Cross. The Biscay Cross was an antenna attached to a wooden construct, which could identify enemy radar signals. It needed to be turned by hand, a significant drawback. Nonetheless, the cross gave the submariners just sufficient warning of an RAF attack so that a crash dive could save their lives. By October, this innovation rendered the air attacks ineffective. Once the radar wavelengths were changed, so the cross in turn became obsolete. Then the Germans changed the Enigma code system and for a while, Britain was robbed of vital information. The U-boats had gained the upper hand once more and Allied shipping suffered appalling losses as a result. Britain's fate once more hovered on the precipice. But the battle was changing shape. With the entry of America into the war, new equipment and, more importantly, ships in greater quantities began to help the Allied war effort. It was badly needed. The British were no longer waiting for the Germans to bring the fight to them. New frigates going into action in 1942 were built solely as U-boat hunter-killers. Sailing at a distance from the convoys, armed with ASDIC and better weapons, they formed hunter-killer patrols that harried the submarines, preventing them from going into attack formations. The battle was nonetheless ferocious. In March of 1943, the U-boat tally was 627,000 tons. Dönitz could still be well satisfied with his men. The improving efficiency of the Allied equipment and tactics led to U-boats increasingly being rearmed and supplied whilst at sea, potentially a lethal and at the best of times a hazardous procedure. Once the Allied presence in the Atlantic increased, the Germans took to using submarines as supply ships. The larger Type 9 U-boat, modified and nicknamed the Milk Cow, was assigned the role of supply ship and the system increased the operational time span for the combat boats. In 1943, Hitler tried to keep his Japanese allies happy by deploying some larger U-boats from Indonesia into waters as far as southern Africa. Their presence added little to the actual war effort at sea, whose main theatre was in the Atlantic. 1943 also saw the horrific air raids over German cities, especially Hamburg, which also targeted the submarine bases there. For the U-boats, the successes were starting to be outweighed by the suffering, for the Allies were making headway everywhere. The U-boats ordeal was heightened further through the drain on resources caused by the offensive in Russia, where in January 1943, the end of the tragedy at Stalingrad began the dredging collapse of the Third Reich. Breda resigned in the same month, exasperated and disillusioned by the constant inept interference flowing from the Führer. Dönitz slipped easily into the position of Grand Admiral and prosecuted his task with greater vigor than Reda. It was an academic change, for although his enthusiasm for the U-boats could finally be heard at the highest levels in the Third Reich hierarchy, he was the right man in the right place at the wrong time. Electronic surveillance was now reaching new heights of sophistication and success. Dönitz's own insistence on being kept constantly informed and delivered with detailed information about U-boat positions and activity inadvertently contributed to the Allies' ability to track the submarines. 
and Allied aircraft, American Liberators and British Sunderlands with long-range fuel tanks now covered every last inch of the Atlantic. There was nowhere for the U-boats to hide. The capture of the Enigma submarine codes had enabled the Allies to decipher German U-boat signals without their knowledge. U-boats were more vulnerable than ever. 115 U-boats were now able to sink only 75% of the totals they had reached in 1940, when there were just 80 submarines. 1943 saw almost 300 submarines lost, 40 in May alone. Unless Hitler reacted sensibly, disaster was inevitable. Hitler, had he ever been, was now incapable of sensible action. Any success was welcome, even if relatives of the sailors knew that it was rare for the U-boats to return home after a second operation. Understrength crews were now manned by men barely out of their teens. The chances of these men surviving their maiden voyage was almost nil. Accidents caused by inexperience in handling such difficult craft increased, adding to manpower and equipment shortfalls. It was not unknown for U-boats to mistakenly torpedo their own comrades. But it was foolish to underestimate the U-boats even now. In March 1943, the largest convoy battle of the war took place. Between the 16th and the 20th, more than 40 U-boats were in action as two convoys began to merge in the mid-Atlantic. 100 ships and escorts in total. 21 merchant ships were hit before air and surface escorts forced the submarines to break off the attack. But the setbacks on land were being reflected on the world's oceans. Dönitz felt that he could not allow the submarine losses to continue. He ordered their withdrawal from the Atlantic. It was a moment of triumph for the British. They had withstood the onslaught and the terrible loss of human life. With the help of her American allies, Britain was still unconquered and now ready to take the fight to the aggressor. The destroyers and battleships of the Kriegsmarine were increasingly rendered impotent. Robbed of the vital U-boat arm, their demise was predestined, for the Allied navies could turn attention onto them. One of the worst attacks took place when 1,000 men on the Tirpitz went down with their ship. She had survived 17 attacks. German innovation continued unabated. The snorkel was introduced in 1944 so that the boats could stay submerged for longer. The one drawback was that it went hand in hand with reduced boat speed. A new torpedo, the Type 5 Zaunkönig, was designed to home in on engine noise. It was so fast as to be practically inescapable. In June 1944, the U-boats gave another demonstration of their power. 45 of them homed in on the invasion fleet heading for Normandy. 56,000 tons of shipping were destroyed. For the U-boats, although operations continued through to the last minutes of the war, this was a final large-scale resurgence as a prelude to defeat. Just days before the war ended, the U-boats were brought together for one final show of strength. On April the 29th, 1945, in the last convoy battle of the war, 14 U-boats closed in on a 24-ship convoy. It was a terrifying conflict. During the battle, Hundreds of depth charges were dropped on a single U-boat. When, with heavy loss of life, a frigate was sunk and the U-307 and U-286 went down, the U-boats and Royal Navy ships 
had mercifully claimed their last victims in their uniquely agonizing war. The submarines stayed with their prey into the following day, the 30th. At 3.30 that afternoon, Hitler's suicide finally rid the world of his deformed ideology and regime. With Hitler's death in the Chancellery, Dönitz became head of state to the expiring Third Reich and on the 4th of May 1945, ordered his men to end the hostilities with a message that showed the esteem in which he held the crews that he had been so proud to command. My U-boat men, six years of warfare are behind us. You fought like lions against a crushingly superior force. Unbroken in courage, you are laying down your arms after an heroic fight without parallel. In reverence, we remember our dead comrades. Comrades, maintain your U-boat spirit with which you fought most bravely and unflinchingly during the long years. Well aware that the war was lost, Dönitz nonetheless kept the fighting going long enough to enable the Kriegsmarine to scuttle its ships, a cynical disregard for soldiers' lives in the choice between an honorable exit for the Kriegsmarine or death for the fighting Wehrmacht men. Known as Operation Rainbow, the sinking of the ships was an agonizing repeat of the end of World War I that Dönitz never imagined that he would see. It was May the 4th, 232 U-boats would never sail again. 154 finally surrendered. A further 115 boats were sunk off the coast of Ireland during the first year of peace. Karl Dönitz, the man who could have helped Hitler's Reich spread across the world, was released from prison in 1956. Dönitz retired to a village near Hamburg and died at the age of 89 in 1980. Erich Reder was released from prison in 1955 and died on November the 6th, 1960 in Kiel, northern Germany, from where 131 U-boats had been launched. Losses amongst the U-boat crews had been on an unparalleled scale. Of the 41,300 men who entered U-boat service, over 30,000 were killed in action, 5,000 captured. Sinister, prowling the ocean depths, the U-boat has written its uniquely frightening, uniquely cruel chapter in World War II history.